This sort of got me thinking about scaling and about that first step being getting time back. And I talk about this so much in my Biz Academy program. It's a task called Systemize It. What we do is the very first step when anyone is looking to scale and go from one to one to one to many, what we get them to do is this task. And I actually do this quite regularly now. And I use the exact same task in the template that I give our students in our program because it works. Welcome to Swift Coaches Academy, a podcast dedicated to bringing health and wellness professionals the uncensored truth behind what it really takes to succeed in the health industry with me, your host, Zenia Wood. As an accredited exercise physiologist and business owner for almost a decade, I'm on a mission to transform the lives of ambitious health professionals like you who want more and are ready to take action to create incredible impact in your careers and unlock financial freedom in your business. So join me as I speak candidly with industry leaders about the struggles and successes from within the trenches through thought-provoking conversations. So little life update to start today's podcast episode, um, or rather business update as well. Uh, About six weeks ago now, my second operations manager who I hired um, at the start of this year resigned. Now, um, this was pretty unexpected and initially I made it mean a lot of things about me, about like, you know, I had thoughts of like, well, I'm obviously a terrible leader. You know, I must have done something wrong. Like, you know, no one can do this role. It's too big. It's, you know, it's too challenging. No one can, can do this. Um, and I realized that firstly, this didn't have to mean anything about me. While obviously, yes, everyone, including myself, I can definitely put my hand up and say that leadership is something that I strive to and am continually improving on. And I don't think that it's my biggest asset. I do think I'm stronger in other areas. I also sort of sat back from that after taking a beat and going, well, this doesn't have to mean anything about me. And what what lessons can I learn from this? And how can I turn this into an opportunity? And so what I did is I actually got an opportunity, which was great to step back and think about like, do I really, like, what am I using my business manager for? What are they doing? Who else could do those tasks? Um, is it something that I need someone full-time for? And, you know, is there, is this maybe multiple people's jobs that can be split as opposed to trying to make shift this into one person? Because being a small lean team, if you have had staff members, you would know that you do sort of start off with like makeshift roles of like a little bit of sales, a little bit of customer support, um, a little bit of, you know, finance management, that there's lots of spinning plates and it has to be the right person in that role to serve that purpose. Now, when I first hired her, I thought that she was great for that role. And then things sort of came up and realized that, you know, this actually wasn't the best role for her. And so it was actually a great thing that she moved on. And so the other thing that it made me think is like, I actually don't want a huge team. I don't want to be managing a ton of people. Like that stuff doesn't light me up in business. And it made me realize like, okay, I've, I've got this role that was full-time do I need that? And what can I do? And the great thing that that helped me recognize is that I need to figure out what to do with this, um, this, this new challenge that I'm facing. So I was looking at, well, obviously we're scaling the business. We are looking to, you know, grow and expand and do all of these things. But the thing that often gets missed when people are looking to scale is the very first step. And the very first step to scaling is making sure that we win back more of our time first. Because if you are trying to create a new product, create a new service, go from one-on-one to one to many, then typically you're going to need at least some brain space, if not a a bit of time to be able to create, execute, implement all of this infrastructure and the actual course or program or whatever it is that is the new scalable service, right? Right. And so what I realized is that now I've just had this full-time role sort of been put back in my lap and I could absolutely go and hire someone tomorrow. However, what I realized, and I, I sat down and actually like broke down the entire role and everything that was included. And it gave me a great opportunity to go, I can actually delegate some of these things to 
some of my virtual assistants. I can delegate these things to some of the coaches in our rehab business. Um, I can take on a couple of them and then I can outsource a couple of them. So things like marketing or, or advertising, things like that, that could be a more specialist role and we could get a better ROI on someone doing that intentionally who is very, very skilled in that area rather than a generalist. Um, and so what that's going to mean for me is that uh, we're going to be able to get a little bit of the team more involved in some of these projects, taking on bigger new opportunities, which is really cool because they're all getting to step up in their own way. And it also means that I am able to have a look at getting some more specific support from people in their area of expertise. So this sort of got me thinking about scaling and about that first step being getting time back. And I talk about this so much in my Biz Academy program with our students about uh, it's a task called systemize it, scale. And so what we do is the very first step when anyone is looking to scale and go from one to one to one to many, what we get them to do is this task. And I actually do this quite regularly now. And I use the exact same task in the template that I give uh, our students in our program because it works. And because it's really, really clear to see what is going on, um, who else could be appropriate for this role. And if we delegated this, how much time would I get back and how much, how much energy or joy would I get to regain? So what I mean by that is inside this task, um, I call it the RADS, R-A-D-S, remove, automate, delegate, and systemize. So these are the four things. And um, while I have a virtual assistant agency where we outsource and, and get virtual assistants um, sort of plugged into other businesses and get them doing all the shitty admin stuff, the reconciling, the, the writing programs, and actually putting them into the, the programming app that you use, which saves us so much time. While I have that, I also recognize that that's not the first step either to scaling. It's not hiring someone and it's not even hiring a virtual assistant. Um, so the first step is to implement this, this RADS method. So uh, I'm going to walk you through that today and how you can get more time back, not just in your business, but in your personal life as well. And how you get to do the things that light you up and make sure you're focusing on those based on your goals for your business. Uh, a couple of misconceptions about scaling before we dive in is that you need a huge team. Um, when I started, I mean, starts from starts with one and then it grows, right? The first thing I did to scale was hire a virtual assistant to win back some time. Uh, then the second thing that I did was hire a coach, an assistant coach to take on some of the client load. And then we've hired a couple more people here and there, but like we do not have a big team and I like it that way. I like it lean. I like to be able to have them involved in the back end of the business and um, you don't have to have a huge team to scale even a health business. You do not have to go in the traditional route of like, I'm going to own a clinic or that's the only way I can make, you know, more profit, more impact, more, you know, um, change more lives. So, that's the first thing. Second thing is that uh, you have to go backwards in your profit. So basically you have to dip into all of all of that money that you saved up to then scale your business. Now, while you absolutely can do that, you can also find other ways to get income or I've bootstrapped everything. And this is my preferred method uh, because it, it gives you, it helps you be resourceful as opposed to just having money and throwing money at these problems. And when we are resourceful, we are therefore a lot more creative with our solutions that are not just, oh, I'll pay someone to do it or I'll put some money into this and we'll just get it done. And I say this because I did it. I built a scalable program before I had ever hired anyone other than my Swift virtual assistant. And that was the first thing that helped me at gain profit. And I also didn't go backwards to create that program. I got the people who were interested to pay for the program and then we did it from there. So um, you can absolutely scale without having to go backwards in profit. Of course, investing in, you know, like mentoring and programs and all these things that I was doing to help support that was a part of this. However, um, the first time that I went in from just me to scaling, I didn't go backwards in profit at all. And we made sure that we were getting sales that were in accordance with what we were paying someone, i.e. for the staff member, we were 
uh, we were like, they were bringing in clients or I'd handed them over clients. And so they were making money for the business. So from day one, it was profitable, which is another thing that I personally love teaching people how to do and recommend. But let's get back to our RAD method because I want to walk you through this. And by the end of this podcast, you are going to have at least eight different strategies that you can implement right now to be able to systemize your business to start to scale. So we're going to talk about firstly, understanding your hourly rate. To be able to be really confident about removing, automating, delegating, and systemizing in your business, you need to understand what you are worth for what you are doing. Now, um, this is probably pretty easy if you think, you know, I see a client for 45 minutes and I charge 75 bucks, which would mean $100 is an hour, for example, let's say. So anything that is less than $100 per hour to be done, i.e. checking your emails, i.e. reconciling the bank statements, i.e. writing a program or putting a program that you've written into an app, these things are all very, very far below your hourly rate because you get $0 for that, right? So if we can hire someone to do some of those tasks or if we can just create ways to streamline them and make them quicker, more effective for us, or... Better yet, we can automate them so we do it once, spend a little bit more time up front, and then it is totally done and just happens in the background forever ongoing until you decide to change it, then those things are going to help accelerate your growth. Now, sometimes when I encourage my best students to do this, they have fears, they have reservations, they're like, well, you know, I just... I, I do the bank reconciling at eight o'clock at night, you know, while I'm watching TV which is all well and good. And clearly those are not hours that you are billing for and you're not going to bill for. However, the energy mentally that that saps for you and the decision-making fatigue and just the fact that that's typically a task that us as coaches do not love and doesn't light us up is actually going to, I guess, deplete our our fun and our energy storage to be able to go and create scalable products and have the mental capacity to do so. So even though you may not be making money during those hours, you are more effective and efficient when you are fresh, when you have had your own time and space to be able to wind down, have fun, whatever that looks like for you. And so I say this with tough, tough love, but you are not going to scale if you have so much control, and this is absolutely coming from a place of I was, I'm a recovering perfectionist and I'm a very, very much recovering control freak as well. Uh, most of the reason why we become business owners and entrepreneurs. And so it's working through that and recognizing that even 80% of what you as the owner or the founder can do is going to be good enough for someone else right? This even comes down to coaching and passing on clients to someone else because you pull your heart and soul into it. And then if someone's not as good as you, then it's really hard to hand them over. However, they're never going to get there unless you allow them to go through the mistakes and the things that we went through. So you do have to learn to let go of some of this shit and some of these control freak itis beliefs so that you can actually scale and grow your business and understand that you cannot grow and scale a business without letting go of some of that and delegating to other people. Cool. So um, with all that being said, the first thing we're going to go through is the R, which is remove. So the question here I have for you is what shit do you need to stop doing? Now we're going to go through examples that I have actually done both in my personal life and in my business that you can take ideas from and go and implement yourself too. So you may want to write these down. You may want to pause this, go grab a pen, or you may just want to have a listen and then write them down later. That's totally cool. To remove. Personally, I removed spending time with certain family members that don't fill my cup up as much, right? I don't totally ignore them and never ever talk to them or see them, but do I need to see them every week or every other week? Absolutely not, right? And so that is something where I looked at sort of my life and who I want to spend my time with. And I was like, some of these people are not my people and that's totally okay. And 
I have chosen to then spend time with other people instead or just remove that, right? Like I do not have to spend time with people every single week doing certain things. And so for me, that was something that I have found my a happy level of amount of time with certain people that works for both parties, right? And so that way I do get to see those people, but I also don't spend excessive amounts of time with them. And I don't um, continue to say yes to these things when it doesn't light me up all the time. In business, what have I removed? I've removed responding to every single email or DM. Not everyone needs a response. Like that's someone else asking you for you to pay attention to their wants and needs, right? And some people, sometimes you can just delete it. And then even better yet, if you have a virtual assistant running your admin email, they can deal with it or delete it and not even bother you about it, which is freaking awesome. And um, other things that I have removed, I guess this is a, a hybrid business and personal plays out, distractions through notifications on absolutely everything on my phone. And I mean, absolutely everything other than phone calls and text messages. And my phone is always on silent, always. So I usually have my phone face down like it is right now on my desk. And unless I w wish to pick it up, I will see notifications that come through only via text message and via like missed calls. Everything else. I'm talking like, I see so many people who have like all these Instagram notifications. Someone commented, someone liked, someone shared, someone DM'd you, like whatever. And that's one platform, right? Like how many notifications through email, through wherever are we getting that is distracting our focus from what's truly important to us? Because these are all other people's priorities, right? So how many times are we allowing ourselves to get distracted? Do you have a phone, uh, sorry, not a phone, a watch that like buzzes every time you get certain notifications? And is that really necessary? You can remove all of these. And trust me, like for deep work, deep focus, that is huge. So have a think about what you could do to remove certain things that just don't need to be there in your life anymore, right? Um, to automate, we're going to go through next. What can you create once? that then lasts forever. So personally, what I do is I have automatic debits from my account for as many things as possible. For all of my, like my mortgage, my um, electricity, my gas bill, uh, even like I have um, recurring subscriptions for um, household items like cleaning products and stuff. And that just gets delivered on autopilot every four months to my house. It was perfect. So I also have automated, like it just rocks up. It's there. I don't have to go and click anything. I don't have to collect anything. I don't have to drive to the shops. It, and that in itself and doing that with so many different things has helped me automate so much of my life. And it's like, I don't really particularly want to spend half my life at the grocery store picking up all this shit, right? So can you automate more things in your life? In business, what I've automated and I hope everyone has this or is thinking about a way that they can make this happen. But client reminder appointments is probably the biggest one that I would recommend people start with. So via email and text, preferably, um, we have a system inbuilt with our CRM, our customer relationship manager, and it automatically, once people book appointments, they um, get those reminders. Also, I've just automated people booking in calls with me because they can go on the website, they can click it and then they can book with me. So that's totally automated. None of this like, oh, when are you free? Like, when can we do it? What time suits you? That one doesn't work for me. None of that. I have automated this so that if people want to book an appointment to learn more about a program, you can just do that yourself, which is freaking great because I don't want to be the one being like, what time have you got? And wasting so much unnecessary time of everyone. I personally, like if I'm going to go to the doctors or something like that, if they don't have like an online appointment thing where I can book in, then I'm like almost not going to go there unless I have to go to that specific facility, right? Like it's just so much more convenient for me to pick a time that works for me and look at my schedule and not be like on the phone to some receptionist being like, what about Thursday at three? No, Friday at four. I can't do either of those. Not worth your time. Cool. So hopefully those are th some things that you recognize that you can automate two. The third one is to systemize. And these are done sequentially, by the way. So um, we start with remove. So get rid of shit, 
So you win back time immediately. Then we want to automate. So we do something once and then it's just done forever until you decide to change it, turn it off, whatever. Then we want to systemize. So this is where we create templates. We have systems that just get followed again and again. It's going to reduce um, mental energy of like writing certain things over and over. Um, but these are things that still need to be like part done manually. So this could be something like email templates. That's something that I do in my business. Um, GP letters or client treatment notes. Like if you have a certain method or way that you do things or you say most things the same every time, can you just like pre-populate or auto-populate that into the template so it's already there and you only have to add a couple of things each time? That has been something that's been really helpful. And I've noticed that it's something that not a lot of coaches, particularly early on, are doing. I have so many email templates for different things um, with dot points and things of just like fill in the blanks. And it speeds up the process so, so much while still having the human element of you being able to add in a personalized touch point. So you can say something personal at the top of the message. You can have a line that says, write something personal. And then you have your dot points, you fill in the dot points, maybe everything else is pre-populated and then go from there. Cool. In terms of systemizing stuff personally, um, so I have, I track my finances every month and uh, for that, I literally have uh, a, in my calendar every month on the fifth of the month, or maybe it's the first Sunday. I can't remember. I think I changed it recently. Regardless, doesn't matter. Once a month, I have something recurring as a calendar reminder in my phone and in my Google calendar that is to track and review my finances. And so it's just a prompt for me as opposed to like, how am I going to do this? When am I going to do it? So that is helpful initially. And then how do I actually systemize it? So I have this like huge spreadsheet that I've created over time, right? But now I literally, I log into my internet banking. I log into my business banking, see how much money are in all the accounts and like just put, put those into a template. And then I also look at, have a little bit of crypto. So I log into there, look at what that's doing. I have um, stocks in the business and personally. So I log into both of those and I just literally like copy paste. Like I'm not doing much manually with those. I'm, I'm a bit of a set and forget person when it comes to investments. So I'm copying and pasting into a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet now spits out all these numbers, like how much I made that month from that particular investment and every single investment, how much I've made for the whole year. There's so much involved in that. But now that it, there's a system there, all I have to do is spend like 10 minutes logging into a few platforms, copy paste, put it into my spreadsheet and then look, review. If I want to make changes, I do. Cool. So those are how you can systemize things uh, in your business or personally. The last one is delegate. Now I said this at the start, I think that your first hire should be uh, someone to help, something that you can delegate and outsource, right? Obviously. However, I think a lot of people get this wrong and they hire an assistant coach. So a mini version of them, which loves the same things they love and hates the same things they hate. So for example, they might be uh, a personal trainer and you're also a personal trainer and you both hate admin, you both hate finances. That is not the best first hire, in my opinion. The best first hire is going to be someone who is complementary to you and effectively your opposite, the yin to your yang. Yang, I like to call it. So uh, hiring someone who can do the shitty admin stuff that you probably hate is going to be an incredible way to make sure that you are delegating shit that firstly is low on the like fun scale for you and is also going to allow you to do more of the things that are going to both increase your hourly rate and increase the number of hours if you want that to be able to work for that hourly rate. So i.e. let's say I get, get I hire a virtual assistant, delegate 10 hours of admin tasks and I have 10 hours to be able to take on 10 hours worth of clients. I wasn't earning anything previously in those 10 hours. So now I have the capacity to earn 10 hours worth of whatever my hourly rate is. So that is huge. In terms of what that looks like from a business point of view, 
it's going to require you creating what are called SOPs or standard operating procedures. So I have this set up for pretty much all of my social media. I will literally create the video or write some text and then everything that you see on carousels, on reels, all of that outside of like me on camera or like most of the words on the carousels, all of the, the imagery, all of the things that pop up on screen, the thumbnail, when it gets posted is totally done by my virtual assistants. And this is a process that I have edited and tweaked over time and I continue to iterate, but it takes so much time away from me. And we have two um, businesses so Swift Movement Academy, our rehab business, and then this one, Swift Coaches Academy. And we have about five platforms for each. So we have Instagram, TikTok, YouTube Shorts, Threads. Um, I think we have a Pinterest as well. And then LinkedIn. So um, perhaps not doing too much on Pinterest, but LinkedIn as well. So that's two businesses, five different platforms. And typically it's like one piece of content per weekday that goes out on each of those. So that's 10 pieces of content per week going out on five different platforms. So it's 50 different places and pieces of content. So yeah, we use a scheduler. We use plan, P-L-A-N-N, if anyone wants to have a look at that. But um, it's going to schedule all your social media stuff. But I also don't do the scheduling, right? I have a system of like, this is what I want posted on Monday on these channels. This is how it works. And then my virtual assistant team will go and execute on that, right? So that frees up so much time for me. And I actually get so many comments and compliments on like, wow, you are, you are fucking nailing all the social media. I see you everywhere. Like you're omnipresent, which is great feedback for me to hear because it means that they're consistently reminded of me and they're more likely to buy because we know that um, people need like at least 20 touch points these days, or I think it's 48 minutes of seeing you and what you do to therefore make a buying decision on average, right? Some are shorter, some are longer, but on average. So if I can be omnipresent and have all the different platforms covered and you open your Instagram and I'm there and you open your LinkedIn and I'm there and you open your YouTube and I'm there, then you're going to continually be reminded of me and that is going to breed no like and trust, okay? The other thing that I delegate personally is cleaning and gardening. Ah, uh, these are activities that do not light me up and these are things that I can absolutely pay someone far less than what I earn per hour. And it's just not a fun task for me. It's not something I want to be spending my weekends or like weeknights doing. And it's something that allows me to go and do something like this. Like create a podcast on a Sunday, I'm gonna have my cleaners cleaning my house at the same time. So for me, that has been huge. And obviously that is the one where I would say most people get stuck or hold themselves back on because I think we can be delegating far sooner than most people are. And it probably comes down to the fact that they don't know how to delegate, which was absolutely me. Like five years ago now, I was, I'd never hired a staff member. The first person I hired was a VA and I would send them a WhatsApp message. And then three weeks later, I'd be like, remember that thing I messaged you? Like, I'm just wondering why it's not done. And that was my way of like, giving tasks off to a virtual assistant, which I look back now and is horrendous. Um, but we have like all these systems and things in place because I've systemized it using the RADS method. And then when we delegate, it is so much more effective and everything's written out and you can go back and review it. And there's video recordings of exactly how to do it. And it just makes the process so much easier. And I'm so much more confident in delegating to a virtual assistant now because I have learned how to be a better delegator and how to be a better leader and how to articulate what I want and how to give feedback and all the things that are required in that. Um, now, cheeky self-plug because we do have a VA agency and I actually teach you how to do all this stuff. We give you our systems, our templates, our methods. If that's something that you're interested in and you're like, hey, really do need to get some time back and I would love to hire some help and a Swift assistant sounds like the thing for me, uh, then I'll chuck a link in the show notes below and you can go and uh, register to get yourself a virtual assistant with us. And um, we get the one percenters 
who are really next level and we continue to upskill them. And I've just found it's so much easier and it just lifts this weight off of you to do be, be able to like either create more things to be able to scale or just be able to spend more time with the people that you love. So regardless of the reason why, I think VAs are fucking godsend and those are people that I couldn't live without in my business. So if you want one of those, then definitely check out the link below for that. Um, I hope that that has helped. I'm going to do a little recap. So we ha- we talked about our RADS method and so that was remove, automate, delegate, and systemize. Now, I actually do that in the order of remove first. So get rid of the shit you don't need to, then automate the things in your business that you can do once and are there forever. Then I systemize. So it's R-A-S-D technically, but it doesn't sound as cool. So it's RADS. Um, and then so systemize. So create a system that either you or a virtual assistant or a team member or whatever can go and execute again and again. That's through things like templates and stuff and then delegate. So those systems that you've created, you can also delegate them or you can keep them for yourself and they can be your own systems that make things faster, more efficient for you. I hope this has given you a ton of stuff to be able to start to get some time back for you, coach, so that you can scale your business in whatever that looks like for you to go from one to one to one to many. Now, we do have a masterclass coming up that I wanted to chat to you about today as well. This is going to be on the 6th of June, which is a Thursday at 12 noon, uh, AEST, Australian Eastern Standard Time, so Brisbane time, Queensland time, East Coast Australia time for now, Um, no daylight savings. Uh, And we are going to go through our um, new Biz Academy pillars And so those are clarity, sales, and scale. So I'm going to go through those. I'm going to give you a ton more clarity in your business so that you know what you're doing and direction you're heading in and how to get more sales and scale your business to 20K plus months consistently. Uh, So if you are interested in that, definitely jump down into the show notes to register yourself for that because I would love to see you there. I feel like sometimes in the podcast world, I'm like talking into the abyss and I don't know if anyone's listening. So um, to be able to connect with people who are actually listening to this like you would be fucking cool. So I would love to see you there. You can get all the details in that link in the show notes below. And that's all from me today. Until next time, move swiftly. I have a tiny favor to ask of you, and that is to just hit that subscribe button if you have not done it yet. If you've made it this far, then I hope that this has been valuable for you and for us to get more incredible guests in front of your earlobes and faces if you're watching us on YouTube, then please do that now. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for me or something that was a golden nugget that really stood out to you in this episode, I would absolutely love if you flicked me a message over on Instagram at Xenia Wood Official. Until next episode and in whatever you do, move swiftly.